Welcome everyone to the IIVS sponsored webinar on regulatory initiatives for new approaches on traditional toxicity testing. Today's webinar includes EPA plans to reduce the use of animals, how stakeholders can accelerate the process, and IIVS's efforts to address endpoints within the six-pack program. The webinar will include a 15-minute question and answer session following the presentation. Before we get started, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is familiar with the webinar toolbar and can access important aspects of GoToWebinar. Due to the large number of attendees, all audio has been muted except for our speakers and will remain so for the duration of the webinar. You may ask questions by using the question feature at the bottom of the control panel at the right. Click on the arrow to maximize the control panel and view the question window. Questions can be submitted at any time, but will be held until the end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar and the question and answer portion. A PDF of the presented slides and a link to the recording will be distributed to the webinar participants in about two weeks. Now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers. We are extremely pleased to have our guest speaker, Dr. Jennifer McLean from the EPA join us today for this webinar. She is the Deputy Director for the Antimicrobial Division Pesticides program at the EPA. She will be our first speaker today and be introducing the EPA's perspective on the six pack. Our second speaker, Dr. Roger Curran, is the Chief Executive Officer of IIVS and will be presenting on IIVS's efforts to introduce in vitro methods into the six pack program. I will now pass the controls over to Jennifer who will begin the presentation. Hey, good morning. And this is Jennifer McLean from the EPA. I just want to thank the Institute for In Vitro Sciences for welcoming, welcoming me to this presentation and allowing me the opportunity um, to let you know about some exciting things that are happening at the EPA. At the EPA Office of Pesticides Program, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with the U.S. regulatory system, the EPA licenses or registers pesticides in the United States. And we define pesticides as being agricultural conventional pesticides, um, antimicrobial um, products such as disinfectants, um, biochemicals, and microbial pesticides. So it is a... Um, a broad spectrum uh, licensing program for um, in the U.S. Our Office of Pesticide Programs has a strategic direction for um, new pesticide testing and assessment approaches. And the way we look at this is um, we are looking to expand the methods that are used to test pesticides in the applications that come to us and to support um, the, the pesticides that are registered in the U.S. What we want to do is focus methods and testing on the risks of concern and not have a what we call a checklist approach to um, information necessary to support a pesticide application. One of the most important components of our strategic direction is to allow toxicity tests that are so-called non-traditional toxicity tests to move away from in vivo testing and to allow approaches that maybe um, use um, computer predictions or in vitro assays and we think that doing so will actually allow us to expand the amount of information that we, ob we obtain. One of the founding components of this strategy is 
to gain a better understanding of toxicity pathways that will allow us to develop um, non-animal tests. And I'll talk a little bit later about how that's already um, coming to fruition. Understanding the toxicity pathways will really help us better predict how exposures relate to adverse effects and how we might be able to identify um, adverse incidents earlier in a toxicity pathway is important, important in terms of allowing new alternative testing. This is something that we are doing in partnership with our stakeholders. It's really not something that one agency can do on its own, and it's not something that government can do on its own either. It really requires a broad stakeholder engagement to bring in transparency to what the government's doing, but also to ensure that we have public trust in what we're doing. The public wants to understand that when the government is registering pesticides that we fully have evaluated the pesticide for its safety for human health and for the environment. For this reason, we have multiple collaborations set up with industry, interest groups, and federal agencies, and as well internationally, and I'll be talking a little bit about some of those efforts also. This is one um, important federal collaboration to know about that's the foundation of this um, effort. And that's in the United States. Um, we have the, the Interagency Coordination Committee on the Validation of Alternative Methods. There are 16 federal agencies that are part of this, and EPA is a major player in this, as well as the NTP Interagency Center for the Evaluation of Alternative Toxicological Methods at the NAEHS. EPA and NICEDM are partnering in major efforts to develop alternative methods. And one of the methods that's given a high priority is skin sensitization. I'll be talking a little bit about that also. This slide here represents um, the integrated approach to testing and assessment. And it's exactly what I was talking about earlier in that one of the foundations of getting this done correctly is to understand better toxicity pathways. So the toxicity pathways gives us the, deci the decision context for being able to understand when a key event in a toxicological sense gives us an adverse outcome and how we might be able to design tests that can um, look for that key event being triggered by a, a particular chemical. At the EPA, one of the, um, one of the guidance documents that we've recently developed is actually for um, our our internal scientists as well as for the public. And this is our guiding principles for data needs for pesticides. This document was put together to ensure that all of our staff at EPA understand that the goal of OPP is to use existing knowledge and focus our testing on the most important data and to not require data that we don't need, and also to not, not use testing that, re, that uses animals if we don't need to. One of our most important initiatives right now is to focus on the acute toxicity six pack. You may be familiar with the letter to stakeholders that OPP's office director, Jack Hausinger, put out earlier this spring. In the letter, we lay out our near-term goals for significantly reducing the use of animals in acute toxicity testing. This is done, again, in partnership with other government entities and industry and NGOs. And the letter goes through all of the toxicity um, tests and discusses OPP's plans for how we will go about moving from an animal test to a non-animal alternative or to eliminate the test. There are three main objectives that are outlined in the letter, and those are to, first of all, make sure that we 
are evaluating which studies are actually forming the basis of OPP decisions and only focus on those, again, focusing on the risks. Secondly, to expand the acceptance of alternative methods. And thirdly, to reduce barriers to the challenges of developing alternative methods and using alternative methods internationally. This first um, study, the acute dermal toxicity study, is one of the areas where we believe that it's not playing into the decisions that we're making. We've entered a collaboration between the EPA and NYSEDEM to look at the relative contribution of the data from the acute oral and dermal toxicity tests and how those contribute to the decisions that EPA is making for labeling. When we did a comparison of the data from the oral and the dermal toxicity tests, we came to the conclusion that you can see here in the box 4.0, that we believe the analysis supports a conclusion that waivers can be granted for acute dermal toxicity studies for formulations. In, and in lieu of getting those dermal toxicity studies, we would be using the oral toxicity studies for our decisions on labeling. This guidance document went out for comment earlier this year, and we've received a number of comments that are quite favorable. And right now we're working on responding to comments and developing a final guidance document. We expect that to be available in the next few months. We also have another document that we've recently put out, the process for establishing and implementing alternative approaches to traditional in vivo acute toxicity studies. In this document, we outline a general process that OPP plans to use to adopt alternative methods. And we do this with the focus on acute studies, but we anticipate that it could be used for other studies also. One of the other initiatives that we have going on for the acute toxicity studies is to have a pilot program where we're looking at using the GHS dose additive mixtures equation. So we anticipate that this could be used in lieu of oral and inhalation formulation or product testing. What we plan to do is to try to collect from um, applicants and registrants who already um, have GHS dose additive mixtures um, analyses developed for some of their formulations to ask, the, ask them to submit that information along with their application and their in vivo studies so that we can have more information on how well the mixtures equation predicts toxicity. Once we have the data in for us to assess, we'll be looking at whether or not we can accept the dose additive mixtures equation in lieu of animal testing. We're also exploring an option for adopting GHS categories for hazard labeling on pesticide labels. Um, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with the US labeling system, we have a different categorization of hazard than um, in the EU, which is causing a number of challenges with respect to adopting alternative methods because OECD, right now in developing guidelines for alternative assays, develops those guidelines with respect to the GHS categories. And if we want to bring US EPA categories into the picture, we have to do a separate analysis of data to line up the US EPA toxicity categories. And this has been quite a challenge. I think Roger's gonna talk a little bit about um, some of those challenges that we've, that we've come up against um, trying to do this translation. We hope that if we can adopt the GHS categories, then we would be able to directly use the OECD guidelines for new alternative methods. This would not only um, allow us to adopt alternative methods, but it would allow us to do things on a much faster pace than we're doing them right now because we won't have this unnecessary translation step. Unfortunately, doing something like adopting GHS categories for labeling is not a simple process. Our labeling um, standards are 
in our regulations, and so adopting the GHS categories requires rulemaking, which is a lengthy process in the federal government. And of course, there are many complex issues that are going to come into play as we consider um, making a change to our rules, and we'll be looking for um, stakeholders, um, industry, as well as others to be um, advising us on how those issues may come into play um, for your for your for yourselves and for your companies. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the skin sensitization that I mentioned earlier. This is one place where OECD has done a significant amount of work in developing the toxicity pathway or the adverse outcome pathway. You see it illustrated here, and I'm not planning on going over it, but only to show you, um, as you can see highlighted in red, that these are the, uh, this is the place where you can start to identify key events that are going to be um, important in terms of developing alternative assays. So the concept is if you can develop a, an alternative assay that will provide you information on one of those key events, then you will, you will be able to better predict whether or not a chemical that's tested for that key event um, may end up being a skin sensitizer. Because this is so well developed, this is one of the areas where the U.S. ICFAM committee that I was mentioning earlier has really focused its efforts. One of the, um, one of the important um, analyses that the group has recently done from ICFAM is to look at a number of, um, a, a large amount of data using both um, physical chemical parameters, um, the OECD toolbox, which, is a, which has QSAR and in silico methods, and a number of in, in vitro assays in combination with the goal of predicting whether or not a chemical is skin sensitization compared to results from animal assays, the LLNA. The analysis was quite um, successful and I apologize because I'm not sure how to move this thing off my screen. Um, sorry, if I, I hope you have the slides. You can see the most important number here is the 97% on the left-hand side. Um, that with a combination of PCHEM properties um, and QSAR and in vitro assays, the group work group was able to do a prediction that resulted in 97% accuracy, um, which is quite amazing and really promising. And so we're looking forward to taking this further. To a meeting that is happening in October in Italy. This is a really unique opportunity because there will be representatives from all over the world, the US, the EU, Japan, Korea, um, Canada, Brazil. All of those groups will be focused on looking at skin sensitization, alternative assays within a context of regulatory applicability, which is really important. It's not an academic um, discussion, it will be focused on whether these tests are sufficient for um, basing regulatory decisions and, and getting hopefully some agreement across international boundaries um, for the acceptance in terms of, of regulatory um, decision making. What we'd like to do at this um, workshop is to have as much information about all of the um, types of pesticides that we at EPA register, at least that's, that's our goal. The group will be looking at chemicals representing um, many chemical sectors and what we want to make sure that the pesticide information is as robust as possible so that when we make decisions for pesticides at at OPP, we're making a decision based on a large data set that has um, that has really represent representative chemicals from all the major types of products that we regulate. 
We're looking forward to working with um, NYCEDEM on this over the summer before the workshop. And NYCEDEM right now is going out and collecting information um, that industry has to on pesticides in, for these in vitro assays and, and for in vivo assays. And we are at EPA are encouraging industry to contribute to this NYCEDEM effort so that we can get that robust data set and be able to make this conference um, really worthwhile and productive. We hope to come out of it at the end with agreement on the acceptance of skin sensitization um, IATAs and have criteria for accepting future testing strategies in a regulatory context. For eye irritation, um, EPA was already um, out there in front using a combined set of in vitro assays to base decisions for hazard labeling for some antimicrobial pesticides. We have had a policy in place for a few years to allow this, and we're very interested in extending the use of um, in vitro assays, both those that are in our current policy and others, um, for other classes of pesticides. Um, so again, we're working with NYCEDEM and partnering with NYCEDEM to do a data analysis of paired in vitro in vivo data. We already have a large set of data provided by the conventional pesticide industry and um, the initial data that um, US EPA's policy for antimicrobial cleaning products was based on is also in um, the NYCEDEM data analysis. Um, we hope to get as much information as possible, so any um, paired data that a company has on in vitro, in vivo, looking at a particular active ingredient or formulated pesticide, um, we would, we would appreciate that being sent to NYCEDEM so that it can be included in the data analysis. This slide here at the end is just emphasizing what OPP's principles are for um, our data requirements. We want to make sure that we are only taking in data to support applications that we need to make our decisions on and that are focused on risks of concern. And in order to do that, we want to make sure that we ha are as open to alternative methods and to other approaches for gathering information and using existing knowledge as possible. So we are trying to put in place not only the structure in our program, but also the policies in place to allow the acceptance of those alternative methods so that we can avoid the unnecessary use of time and resources as well as um, reduce animal testing to uh, the extent possible. Thank you for your attention and I believe that we can take some questions now, is that correct? We're going to actually go to Roger's presentation now and then we'll take questions at the end. Okay, thank the you. Presentation. So uh, thank you, for Jen Jennifer, for your, uh, your presentation and uh, I'll pass the controls to Roger now. <clears throat> thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Jennifer, for uh, that fine presentation this morning. Um, I have to say good morning to uh, most of the people who are on the line right now, most of our attendees, but also good afternoon and good evening. Good evening to uh, a number of you who are uh, attending uh, either from Europe or from um, Asia. What I'd like to do, well, let's get my first slide. And what I'd like to do today is, is add a bit to what Jennifer has said by giving a sort of a practical real-life background uh, to some of the points of her presentation, uh, especially those about the importance of co uh, co cooperation and collaboration with various stakeholders, especially industry, in, uh, in obtaining the desired result of non-animal uh, testing methods. And, and we know that here at uh, IIBS because as a nonprofit uh, neutral 
uh, organization. We worked with uh, EPA for over 10 years, actually, uh, in ways of trying to, to move non-animal testing into um, uh, EPA OPP usage. And so we actually know the commitment of OPP into uh, utilizing non-animal methods. So it's not just uh, rhetoric that you're hearing from OPP. Uh, we know that it's a commitment because we've been part of positive studies that have uh, gone on to actual use by OPP. But what I will talk about this morning is some new IVS initiatives that will follow on with some of the initiatives of uh, that Jennifer has mentioned uh, out of OPP, nice see them, and then uh, spend the majority on um, a real-life positive project that worked that Jennifer has talked about, which is the uh, looking at a subset of pesticide products, the antimicrobial cleaning products, uh, in terms of replacing ocular, uh, the required in vivo ocular irritation uh, methods. And we'll talk about the conduct of the study, some of the results, stages of approval. And then if you've gotten a little bit bored or you've seen this before, don't hang up, please. Because the next two slides are very important. If they are going to address the fact that just because a regulatory agency accepts non-animal testing doesn't mean that the problem is solved of having all the um, having industry actually use these non-animal methods. So we'll talk about uh, actual patterns of usage and then ways forward. In terms of new initiatives, um, as you just heard from Jennifer, uh, OPP in conjunction with NICEDAM and with ICBAM is currently putting non-animal skin sensitization program methods at uh, a high level of priority for their investigations. And as she said, there's been a call in for existing data. I'll echo the, the need for additional data. And we do know that crop life uh, as, a, as a group and then individual, several individual companies have already submitted a significant amount of information, uh, but more is needed. Uh, to assist, uh, along with other groups, IBS is offering their skin sensitization program, which now employs uh, the major in vitro methods that follow along the um, uh, OECD uh, pathways uh, for in vitro methods, looking at H class uh, keratinosense or leucense um, and DPRA uh, plus computational methods such as the OECD toolbox. So we're trying to fill in um, uh, various assay, assay data along uh, pathways that have been proposed for skin sensitization. Then you can use these results in various proposed IATAs or integrated testing strategies uh, to assist in this EPA OPP program by submitting to NICEDAM or just for your own internal chemical uh, assessments uh, if you desire. And for more information, you can contact the, uh, the head of our skin sensitization activities, Dr. Kim, Kim Norman, uh, at uh, the address knorman and ibs.org. Also, Jennifer was talking about skin irritation, and we have started along using uh, essentially the same pathway that was used before with the successful ocular irritation uh, program, uh, looking at antimicrobial cleaning products for skin irritation. We're using 3D skin models. Uh, of course, as many of you know, our OECD guidelines right now for utilizing 3D models uh, to predict uh, GHS categories. Uh, but again, as Jennifer said, uh, what we found is that the prediction of EPA uh, hazard labeling, and, and I'll talk about hazard labeling and, and what the, at least the terminology is in a few slides, um, is not uh, directly compatible. Uh, so we're looking at uh, different prediction models now that will uh, use data from the three-dimensional cultures to actually predict uh, EPA labeling categories. Uh, even though the major participants in the program right now are manufacturers of antimicrobial cleaning products, we welcome uh, several of those are, are also submitting uh, data from uh, more conventional pesticides and repellents uh, 
and we would appreciate, uh, and certainly they're opening for other people to participate uh, with conventional uh, materials. So you can talk with, uh, if interested, with Dr. Amelia Costin at ecostin and iivs.org. Now to move on to a, a program that was actually successful uh, with EPA is the uh, search for non-animal methods for ocular irritation for a subgroup of pesticides called antimicrobial cleaning products. Now the majority of cleaning products, as many of you know, do not have to go through a registration process uh, before they're marketed. Companies just decide on how to assure the safety generally by using non-animal testing procedures. However, if an antimicrobial claim, as you'll see it illustrated here, is made, then that same product, which for years was sold without an antimicrobial claim, now has to be, now is EPA regulated, and the traditional six-pack of animal is required. So suddenly a household cleaning product uh, becomes a dreaded pesticide that's uh, uh, produced in uh, millions of gallons. Now, this is important, both EPA and industry wanted a predictive and conservative in vitro strategy. So it wasn't industry coming to EPA and, and badgering them that you have to develop this. Both parties wanted this uh, strategy. Uh, and they wanted it to begin with eye irritation because neither group wanted the results of the traditional Dray's rabbit eye test. So these are the types of materials that were included in this uh, assessment, and most of these are familiar to many of you. And the intention then was to determine what the labeling uh, statement would be that would go on uh, to the product with the registration. And you can see the traditional EPA danger, uh, toxicity categories and signal words, danger, warning, caution. Of course, of course, as most of us know, the average consumer doesn't really differentiate well between the words danger, warning, and caution. They all sort of mean the same thing. But there are certain specific statements that also have to be on the product. Uh, for corrosive materials, the Category 2 warning, and so forth. And the major interest to most companies is this division point between 2 and 3, uh, because the first two require um, uh, eye protection to be worn. The last two do not require eye protection to be worn. So you have a dichotomy here between glasses and no glasses. So the purpose of the program was to look at these antimicrobial cleaning products do some type of non-animal hazard evaluation, and then come up with the EPA labeling category that's appropriate. And as you can see, this is a typical label on the back of an antimicrobial cleaning product where the caution uh, category three label has been applied. We decided early on, and all projects should, should start along these lines to use a mechanistic approach. We tried to determine the traditional uh, methods of eye irritation, uh, uh, mechanisms that would cause eye irritation, such as membrane lysis, protein coagulation, saponification, alkylation. Looked at the types of materials that would cause these this type of damage, and then uh, throughout most of the program, actually uh, grouped the products that we were looking at, at according to one of these uh, uh, labelings, so that we would determine if special require, uh, special testing was required for certain of these um, chemical activities. Actually, at the end, we found that there wasn't much need except for uh, those materials that cause oxidative damage. We used as a model the depth of injury model developed on the work of Maurer and Jester quite a few years ago now. Uh, indicating that regardless of the process leading to tissue damage, the extent of the initial injury is the principal mechanistic factor in determining the outcome of the ocular irritation. So even though reversibility is a major concern in EPA labeling and other labeling uh, categories, uh, they pro have proposed rather successfully that it's the amount of initial injury that controls that outcome. We were able to look at three different in vitro assays that most of these 
antimicrobial cleaning products company had used. And these were focused really quite nicely on uh, areas that were just discussed in the um, uh, depth of injury approach. Uh, for example, three-dimensional tissue epiocular, which is um, a three-dimensional culture of the, of the top layers of the cornea, uh, fit very nicely in looking at damage to the upper layers of the cornea or, uh, and a bit of penetration into the stroma. So the ability to tell the difference between materials that caused a little bit of injury here or slightly more. Also the cytosensor microphysiometer, which is a, does real-time measures of cellular metabolism, uh, now utilizes just a monolayer culture of cells, uh, but is able to do this in, fairly rapidly in real time. So it obviously is looking at differentiation between materials which cause a little bit of damage into the surface of the cornea and slightly more. The third method that was looked at is the bovine cornea opacity and permeability assay. Uh, here we're able to use the full thickness cornea, so we're able to uh, use it for uh, differentiation between materials which cause a uh, significant amount of damage to a uh, really uh, severe amount of damage. One advantage here with using the bovine cornea assay is that one can do histopathology as well as do direct measures of opacity and permeability, uh, but utilize histopathology to, to actually visualize uh, the extent of damage throughout the uh, cornea from the, down to the endothelium. Uh, this is not part of the EPA uh, approved package right now, but it does uh, it can assist you in making some decisions. So we ended up with a depth of injury model and with three uh, in vitro methodologies that covered a differentiation in this top area and the BCOP more differentiation in the bottom area. The data collection was important as it will be in any of the activities that uh, EPA and NICEDM do. Uh, in the case of the ocular irritation, we used only historic data, uh, did an analysis of the data that was available from the first call in of data, and then decided where gaps appeared in uh, the severity of the injuries. So uh, new in vitro testing uh, was often required to fill out the data set. What was important is that industry provided the data and provided a reasonable indication of the percentage of materials in the formulation. So we were able to look at uh, not only the results of the uh, toxicity studies, but also uh, carry that back to a reasonable representation of what the formulations were. So there was amount of data sharing of industry that was very important in this collaboration. Then a very important part of any analysis was considering the variability of the animal test. Uh, in other words, what our, what our goal was. And the initial uh, analysis uh, with the skin sensitization program that Jennifer was talking about, they're going to be looking at the local lymph node assay, uh, but then moving on to potentially other standards such as uh, human information. So we wanted to know how gold was the gold standard or was it a copper standard that we were using? To do that, one of the, one of the ways to get an estimate was to uh, use data, much of the data, I should say, that was in for the antimicrobial product was data from earlier studies that used six rabbits uh, as the testing group for the DRAES test. And we made a, an assumption, uh, a reasoned assumption, that out of these six animals that were used in the study, I've used cows here just to give rabbits a break for a while, uh, that you could divide these, you could see how close the results of the individual animals uh, reproduced each other. And we could look at these six animal studies by groupings that are with the more common now three animals per test group and we could make various combinations of the six animals, A, B, and C. Another combination would be A, B, and D, and so forth. And you can mathematically easily determine that out of these six animal studies, you can get 
20 groups of three. So you could essentially say you can get 20 new results uh, from the animal study. And we looked at not just a random sampling of how one laboratory reproduced another, but we were conservative and looked at probably the best, some of the best animal data uh, that for the DRAES test that has ever been produced. And this was from 24 personal care products that the um, uh, personal care products uh, company provided. Uh, this was early uh, at the time of the Cosmetics Toiletry and Fragrance Association, CTFA. Uh, these were studies done by a single laboratory under good laboratory practices, all within a very short period of time. So it's hard to say that we could have gotten a better set of data. What was interesting, when we looked at the hazard categories from breaking down the 20, uh, excuse me, the six rabbit tests into 23 rabbit tests, that there were seven cases where there were really significant differences from what's in the results of the animal study. For very mild products like category four materials, generally all of the three rabbit combinations gave the same results as the, uh, as the uh, six rabbit test, which one would expect. But for many of the, at least seven of these occurrences, there were really non-concurrent uh, uh, results. For example, here's one material where 10 of the three rabbit studies would have given you a category one EPA category, and another, the other 10 of the uh, three rabbit studies would have given you a category three. So a large discrepancy, 50% of the time you would have gotten a one, and the other 50% of the time a three. Same was true with this material here, and then other ones had 50-50, sometimes between a category three and a category four. So the point is that the rabbit test, the number that comes out of a rabbit test, the category is not necessarily the same category that you'll get the second time that you do the test. There'll be over predictions and under predictions. An analysis of all these data then led the EPA to approve a process for classification. This is essentially an integrated testing strategy. I apologize a bit for the clarity of this one, uh, but this does come out with the most current, uh, this does come directly from the most current EPA uh, statement on non-animal methods for ocular irritation uh, for antimicrobial cleaning products, but which can also be used on conventional pesticides on a case-by-case -case basis. And you can see this, you can see it much more clearly in the uh, EPA guidance. We always felt that this study was successful uh, for both industry and EPA because of stated purpose. We looked at known toxicity mechanisms. We made data collection transparent, minimizing company secrets. We did a transparent data analysis, which is still available for anyone to look at on the NICEDM website. We looked at a testing strategy rather than a single test, and we tried to incorporate information about how gold was the gold standard. This went through an initial submission by a background review document, and I'm putting this down to show that uh, EPA is flexible yet in how things come to final determinations. ICBAM recommended additional data, the OPP announced an 18-month pilot program to look at uh, submissions that use the non-animal testing approach. This was later extended. They reviewed information from the pilot. In 2013, issued uh, the first uh, permanent policy on alternative testing strategy. Stakeholders put input into this first guidance. And in 2015, the uh, issue of, issuance of an update, which is now the current program, and that can be found on the EPA website, and it's also the uh, strategy that I just showed you. Now, so we have acceptance by a regulatory agency, but as early as 2014, sadly, EP OPP expressed their concerns about underutilization of the policy. Approximately less than 5% of the AMCP registrations use the non-animal testing strategy. 
and EPA was very reasonably concerned considering the substantial resources they had expended uh, in the past three or four years in reviewing and improving the strategy. So in 2015, uh, we conducted a, a survey of the AMCP members uh, at the suggestion of PETA to try and determine uh, why uh, companies weren't submitting information and to determine ways forward to, uh, to get around this. And this has just come out now. Uh, it's published online, Clippinger Hill et al., uh, Bridging the Gap Between regular, Regulatory Acceptance and Industry Use. It's uh, a... Uh, online in all text and it should be in print uh, this month in the current all text so you can look that up. Reasons given for limited usage, uh, all fairly reasonable in a way. The fact that there is not global regulatory acceptance at this point, meaning that the company is likely having, would have to do the animal test anyway uh, for some other region uh, since it is required by other countries or even certain U.S. state authorities. There was concern that even though US EPA uh, accepted the non-animal testing strategy, would Cal EPA uh, accept this strategy as most manufacturers would, would want to register in California as well. There was uncertainty within industry about regular uh, reviewers' familiarity. Would this slow things down? Uh, concern that the alternated uh, testing strategy might overestimate the hazard. Time and cost involved if the company has to do both non-animal and animal tests. And the time and uh, accompanying cost if the regulatory agency just took longer to review your product because of unfamiliarity with the non-animal method. So these were presented to EPA OPP and discussed uh, in an open meeting and a number of proposed ways forward were, were uh, discussed around the table between industry, animal welfare, and OPP. Everyone agreed that efforts need, were needed to harmonize testing requirements first nationally and then internationally. Continued training of EPA was discussed. EPA has committed to do this, has done it in the past and IAVS will continue to volunteer to provide training to EPA staff on understanding uh, the data and data interpretation out of in non-animal methods. Question came up of pro providing expedited review, and this was actually being looked at by EPA at this time uh, as, a, as a way forward. Uh, there should be recognition by industry that even though there may be additional costs, there's certainly long-term value in conducting the non-animal assays to uh, support other uh, efforts around the world. And then EPA and, and industry both have to recognize and realize that in some cases there will be what might be under prediction of a uh, Dray's rabbit test or over predictions. Uh, this will always occur because that's the Dray's test itself conducted a second time could over predict and under predict. People who participated in this program and should be acknowledged are listed here, Clorox, Colgate, Palmolive, et cetera. You can read them. Uh, the Accord Group, ourselves, and also all the EPA staff who participated uh, over the years. So I'd like to thank you for your attendance this morning. We're going to open it up for questions here in a minute, and uh, hopefully we can uh, enjoy the last 15 minutes. Thank you, Roger, and thank you very much to all of our presenters. Um, as Roger said, we'll now open the floor up to some of the questions that we have received. So we're going to just open it up here. Okay, the first question that we have is for Jennifer McLean. Will the efforts of OPP is making to use alternative approaches for regulatory required toxicity testing be applicable to testing needs EPA's chemical chemicals office has, especially since the TSCA reform rebill Congress approved encourages the use of new type of tests? Hi, uh, this is Jennifer. I think that the 
that the groundwork that the pesticides program is establishing with these efforts will help the EPA in general in its ability to evaluate um, tests that um, will be acceptable under other statutes such as the um, such as the statute for the um, for Tosca that the questioner was asking about. Um, is there any view on using pH and alkali acid reserve data for evaluating irritation as per the paper by Young? Oh, I think this is probably one for, oh, for Jennifer, Jennifer uh, although uh, if we're looking at skin irritation, uh, the first labeling category, category one, uh, for corrosive materials could potentially be answered by uh, looking at alkaline acid reserve. Uh, but I don't want to say what <laughs> uh, what the regulatory agency would do. Yeah, this, this is Jennifer. The, um, I'm not familiar with that particular paper, but I would say in general, we are looking to um, combinations of information to help us answer the questions that um, we have on the hazard of a particular formulation or chemical. So as I mentioned in the discussion of the, um, the work group that looked at some information on skin sensitization, um, we're very much interested in um, not only using physicochemical properties, but using it in combination with in vitro methods or um, predictive methods to try to get the um, greatest accuracy possible. So this is a comment made so long, so as long as in vivo tests are allowed and are less expensive than a battery of in vitro tests, will they they predominate or probably predominate? Um, I'll answer this, and, and I think Roger can probably um, add. I think that um, the questioner is pointing out um, one of the barriers that we have identified to adopting in vitro is that it's maybe cheaper or and sometimes easier. Um, to just submit what a company has typically submitted and, and you can see that in some of the specifics that Roger just outlined in the survey that was done. Um, but our hope is that if we can establish a solid set of alternatives that there are many companies that are um, motivated to reduce animal testing and to be a leader in the U.S. as well as um, globally to move this forward. And the more in vitro tests are used, the cheaper and easier those in vitro tests will become. And our hope is to eventually phase out the in vivo test. This is just one, one step um, along a pathway um, and ultimately if we just if we have the tests in hand, we can change our regulations to require alternative methods be used in instead of animal methods. We're not there yet, but that's what we have our long term goals set at. I think that was a very good answer from Jennifer, and I think her last comment was the last part of that quite, uh, answer was was quite interesting. That uh, eventually it could be required that only in vitro data are uh, submitted. Certainly there are similar types of regulations existing in, in Europe right now. Uh, I, I think there are probably a number of, of uh, contact research organizations on the phone right now who are, who are listening to this presentation and my guess is that they would all agree with one of our other assertions that even though that the, the cost of in vitro assays will be coming down as more people uh, uh, attempt to use them. So even even though it may be, especially with a battery of tests, it's certainly probably more expensive to do the in vitro than the in vivo right now. Um, there's still all the always the ethical and, and moral considerations that 
is necessary as to really how do you want to do your, your assay. And the, the price is, will come down. Sir. Okay, our next question is, please confirm we can start submitting waivers for acute dermal toxicity studies. And uh, the additional question is, can you provide guidance as to what data should be presented in these waivers? Um, yes, applicants um, may submit um, waivers for the dermal toxicity studies. And um, I'm pretty sure the draft guidance document that we put out um, speaks to that point already and has some information. Um, the final doc doc guidance document, which we expect to have out in the next couple of months, will definitely contain that information. Um, but for now, you can submit a waiver for the dermal toxicity study um, and just use the oral toxicity study as your support and the reference to the guidance document. It should be pretty simple. All right, so I think the last question we have is the regulatory status of what is the regulatory status of alternatives for acute oral testing and acute inhalation? Right now, those um, what we're doing is um, starting a pilot program to um, look at the use of the GHS mixtures equation. Um, you can find that on one of my slides when they come out. And it's also contained in the letter to stakeholders from OPP that came out this spring and is on the EPA website. And we are encouraging companies to provide us with um, data or information that they have on hand um, using the GHS mixtures equation um, as they're doing submissions with their applications now so that we can get enough information in to assess the utility of the equation for predicting the oral and inhalation toxicity. That's our, that's our pathway that we're um, hoping will pan out, that we'll be able to at least for formulations, be able to accept a predict a um, an equation, a, a modeled um, toxicity rather than the um, in vivo assay results. Okay, we have a few other questions that just came in. Why is there a difference in regulatory bans on cosmetic animal testing bans versus cleaning products? Um, this is general. I'll just briefly say that because there are multiple statutes that in multiple laws in the United States that regulate chemicals um, in different ways, and that leads to some um, potential inconsistencies with um, how the government looks at and assesses chemicals, in part because they're used in different ways. Um, and because of the law that Congress has put in place to control the chemicals um, underneath that law. Okay, so I think this will be our probably our last question. How willing do you think the authorities are to accept in vitro toxicity testing as alternatives for subchronic and chronic rat toxicity studies in rodents and non-rodents? How many years from now? I don't know the answer to that question, but we are definitely um, interested in taking the science as far as it can go and looking for um, alternatives to um, animal assays and to using other information to um, understand the um, potential adverse effects of, of chemicals on, on humans and the environment. This is certainly a hard prediction to make. Uh, ten years ago, there were many people who would have thought we would never have regulatory acceptance of even uh, for some of the acute toxicity endpoints that we now have and now have seen. Um, these acute endpoints are going to fall one by one, uh, but then the longer term studies are not within our reach right now. There's certainly a lot of activity around the world and looking at 
subchronic and uh, and chronic studies, and I I don't think any of us would doubt the fact that we're going to be there uh, at some time. But to make a, a prediction of the uh, of the time of the number years is uh, certainly difficult. Hopefully, it's even sooner than we think. Okay. Okay, so I just wanted to thank you all for joining our webinar. At this time, um, we have completed our webinar. So as a reminder, we may not uh, have been able to answer all your questions on air, but please submit further questions to our presenters directly by the emails listed below here on this page. Um, and have a great, great rest of your day. Thank you.